Welcome to Healing Rain. I'm Sue Dautweiler, your host. My goal is to help you live with more passion, love with more purpose, and lead an overcoming life. Well, today on Healing Rain, we have Rachel Scott, an author, podcaster, and brand strategist. She's here to talk about how God brings healing in every area of our lives. Today on Healing Rain, I have Rachel G. Scott with me. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here soon. <laughs> and we met at the podcast movement, and it, it was one of those times where I sat next to someone and I sent so much of the power and the presence of God resident in your life that, that I kind of prayed for you and prophesied over you at our first meeting. <laughs> Yes. And you were spot on with everything you said. It was just such a blessing. And let me say a very unexpected one, because that was not like a faith based thing. So I'm sure people were looking like, what is she saying to her? <laughs> but it was so God and it was such a healing that happened in that. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I love going to secular type of events and God showing up. And, you know, that yes. was happening to me all day long. I mean, a Holy Spirit just loves to show up. And, you know, I knew that um, it's a friendship in the making. So I always watch when God does that. And you have a real healing journey. Where did your healing journey really begin? Yeah, you know, I was thinking as you asked that question, and I go back to a moment, I want to say, it probably wasn't too long ago, maybe about three or four years ago, and uh, my daughter sings, and I didn't know that this was like a gift that she was going to have, I thought it was just like, okay, all kids like to sing, but it's really a part of her gift, but what God showed me was that her gift was connected to my gift, but I had to heal from my gift first, so um, there were years of my singing being connected to just pain. I started singing in the children's choir when my parents got divorced. And that was kind of a, a therapy. It was a, it was a worship time for me. It was a time where I got to experience God. And it went from singing in my childhood to becoming an adult. And I was singing and I was in a very unhealthy relationship. And at the time, um, I had been given the position of the minister of music at the church and was singing and was leading and doing all of these great things as a singer. And then uh, I that, that relationship ended, I did get a divorce. And when I remarried, I stopped singing. I, I didn't sing at all. And interestingly enough, my husband and I, we met at the studio and we were both working on a worship song. So even our story began around music. And um, I stopped singing and I couldn't figure out, I felt this resistance to singing, but I couldn't figure out what it was until one day when I was getting myself ready. Well, let me backtrack a little bit. My daughter kept saying, mommy, can you sing Mary, ha Mary Had a Little Lamb? And I'm like, why does she keep asking me to sing this song? And I was like, I'll sing it tomorrow. You know, why is she asking me? And every night she would ask me. And I realized that the song she wanted me to sing was not Mary Had a Little Lamb. It was actually um, Jesus Loves Me. But for some reason, she was confusing it. I don't know why. So anyhow, I started singing and figured out the song she wanted me to sing. And I was just feeling something as I was singing it. And so I left out the room and I told my husband, I was like, I just feel like crying. And I, I don't know why. Like there's, she keeps asking me to sing and I'm, I'm getting a little frustrated by a, my little girl asking me to sing and I don't know what's going on so he was just like you know lean into that and ask God what that's about and so one day as I was getting ready um for the day I heard God and I was talking about it and he was like you have connected singing to pain but I want you to connect it to my goodness so I'm about to take you into a season where every song that you sing is for my glory and I started to begin playing worship music again and to begin singing. And my daughter was singing with me. And as I'm listening to her, I was like, wait a minute, this little girl has a, a voice on her. Not just like she can sing like a little girl, like she had a voice. And I continued to just 
invite worship back into the home and um, just experience God through singing. And eventually I realized this is her gift. And the reason God wanted to set me free was so that I could pass the baton so that I could pass the mantle onto her so that she can begin to do what God had called her to do and operate in the gift of singing. So that journey was such, so pivotal for me because I started to see how what I walk through is not always for me. What God is healing me from is not always for me, but it's often for those that are connected to me. You know, I love your story and I'm, I'm so thankful for your husband because he helped you position your heart to be healed. Yes. And as listeners, you may not have thought about this, but you know, brain scientists have studied the brain and where there's trauma or places of unforgiveness or hurt or pain, our brain actually fuses together in what it looks like is little thorns. And mm -hmm. what they found out is that there are different things where sometimes it's a smell, sometimes it's a sound, it's our senses that get fused together with trauma. And then what happens is one thing triggers the trauma reaction and when there's been a place of um, profound pain that we've been in survival mode, you know, sometimes that that little thorn on our brain <laughs> remains fused until God brings about an opportunity. And one thing that brain scientists have actually seen is that things like what you did or unforgiveness or beginning to sing for joy, it actually heals the brain of the trauma. Did you know that, Rachel? I did not. And I love brain science. Oh, I did not know that. That's that's amazing. It just shows how science and God work hand in hand. <laughs> like he is the creator of all things. Yeah. And how trauma is. And, you know, the other thing that I find a similarity in our stories is, you know, I had been abused as a child and some of the things I blocked out until I started having children. And then I would have children and I'd have a flashback. You know, my daughter was turning two and I have flashback memories of when I was two, you know, things that we haven't been able to articulate or heal sometimes um they come up through our children have yes, you seen that, that? yes 100 percent. my journey i remember um when my daughter my first daughter she turned eight eight or nine and i went through this weird phase because i started thinking what was going on in my life at eight or nine, because I don't remember it. I couldn't remember anything, but that was the point where my parents were divorced. So I remembered all my teachers and everything before eight or nine. And I remembered afterwards, but that age, I couldn't remember anything. And so as she, she's 13 now, but she um, was like maybe nine, 10, 11. I went through this moment where I'm like, what am I supposed to do as a mom at this age? Because I say with my dad. So my mom left, I say with my dad, I'm like, what am I supposed to do as a mom at this age? I still had a relationship with her, but she wasn't in the home. So I didn't get to see those things. And I went through a hard time and I couldn't figure out why until I pointed it back to that moment where I didn't have that. I didn't see that the way that, you know, I would have wanted to. I had other mother figures that stepped in, but of course it wasn't the same. And allowing myself to heal and say, okay, you may not know what to do, but you can lean into God. And that's 100% what I did when she was at that age. And I would even ask her, hey, what are, you know, the kids, what are the moms around you what, of, of your friends doing? And that would help me. But I'm thankful for that moment and that highlighted moment that came from my daughter, because when I went back, I started to walk a healing journey that I didn't even know that I needed, all because she turned the age that I was when my trauma happened. So yes. <laughs> You know, God's a healer and he heals body, mind, soul, and spirit. And he does it in a revelatory way. Yes. You know, he's a supernatural God. And even if we don't have a framework that's supernatural, you know, it's like he'll show up in yes. whatever way we'll allow him into our lives. You know, he just shows up. Yes. Yes. I love that about God. He is just so intentional with our hearts, you know, and he knows when to 
unfold the next part of it. He didn't pound all these things at me at once and say, okay, you're going to heal from this, 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 this. It was like, okay, you're going to heal from this first. Okay. I'm going to give you a time to just kind of, you know, restore and revive. And okay, now we're going to deal with the next thing and the next thing. And it's constantly things that I see him walking me on a healing journey with. It's not like one and done. It's a constant process. However, what I have found about myself is I'm quicker to respond to the moment. I, before I was not as aware of what it looked like when he was inviting me into healing. I didn't know. But now that I have walked through different things, I'm like, this is an invitation. Let me lean into this invitation that God has for me. Oh, that's so powerful. You know, God knows how to do it. And, you know, one thing I've seen when there's a lot of loss, for example, it's almost like God gives us a shot of, of um, what do you call it when you numb the senses? What's mm, that called? Yes. Um, um, it, I know what I'm talking about. It's like he numbs our senses like Novocaine or something like that, that we can't feel all the pain. And, and it's a part of it because, you know, you've got to get through the funeral or you've got to get through this, you've got to get through. So it's not a bad thing when you go through something traumatic um, because you can't feel the depth of the loss all at once. And I think it's in his mercy that he does that. And when it's childhood pain, often the trauma is so intense that it's like he encapsulates it until we're old enough and mature enough that he's like, okay, it's time. Let's heal this area. And And it's never like, it's never like you reach it. I mean, maybe in heaven, you know, when we get in heaven, you know, (laughs) but it's, it's like, it's an onion. Every layer is, you know, it's a layer of tears and a layer of discovery. Um, And I think I, I have just grown to the point where I look at people and it's like, God's a healer. You're going to be a better person. Yes. because of this process of allowing him to heal your trauma. Right. And I don't, I, I don't think we realize how much trauma dictates how we perceive life, how we engage with people. And, you know, when we hear something, oftentimes we'll hear it through the lens of that trauma and that person cannot mean it that way. They cannot, you know, even be interpreting it that way, but yet we hear it through that lens. And this is why healing is so important because then we're able to hear it through the lens of truth rather than the deception that the trauma often leads. You know, the trauma will create this deceptiveness and it's not that way. And I've had moments where I'm like, I didn't even hear what was being said because I was hearing it or reading it through the trauma. And then I'll go back and read it and say, that's not even what that said. You know, and my husband was so key. <laughs> he really was. My husband was so key. You know, I went through um, a custody battle. I'll talk about this um, in one of my books, but I went through a custody battle seven years. And I, it was, it was a place of, it was such a trauma, trauma field moment. And I would literally not even be able to go to the mailbox because I'm like, if I go to the mailbox, I'm going to pull out another court order or another something. And my husband was so key in just not only guarding me during that time, but helping me to say, okay, Rachel, pause. Let's read this email again, because what I read and what you read are two different things. And it was almost like the enemy would twist what was being said so that it could feed the trauma response, as opposed to what God wanted me to see, which was the the peace that was actually present in that moment. Wow. You know... I, I have a feeling your our husbands would enjoy each other yes. because, you know, I would say my main agent of healing, you know, other than the Holy Spirit himself, of course. Right, right. But my husband. 100%, yes. It, it, it's just, it makes such a difference to have a husband that's devoted to you growing in Jesus. Yes. you know, and pointing you to Jesus. One thing my husband did, because as I was resolving trauma in my life, 
I would sometimes wake up with dreams, you know, and they were just part of it was revealing things that I had gone through, you know, working things out. And he kept by our bed. It's still there. It's a book that's how to pray for your wife. Mm -hmm. And it's scripture prayers. And he had a flashlight and he would just open middle of the night sometimes open that up and like just read the word of God over me. Wow. You know, if it was fear, if it was, you know, whatever the emotion was. And I, I want to say it was like, I feel like that was years that he did that, <laughs> you know? Yes. And I, I'm saying what a gift from God yes. that that God gives a husband and a wife to be healing agents in each yes. other's lives. I mean, when you have a really good relationship, that's what happens. And often you're opposite from each other, yes. but you're helping each other heal. Yes, that is absolutely what I experienced with my husband. I mean, there are so many times where I um, I'll talk to God about it and the wisdom or the word that God wants to release to me comes through him. You know, it's not God speaks directly to me 100 percent, but there's times where I'm just kind of stuck in that emotion so much that he will use my husband to help me move from the emotion, that emotional place to the place where I can hear truth where I can hear, and then he'll continue speaking to me and revealing to me after that. So many moments where that has happened. Oh, that is so powerful, Rachel. I'm, I'm just, I'm grateful to God. You yes. know, it's a gift because you've, you've gone through a difficult marriage that ended in divorce and, and you've gone through a redemptive marriage. And yes. I'm thankful for the goodness of God in your life. Oh, thank you. Me too. God is continue to show himself so, so faithful. Yes. Well, let me ask you this question. You have a real passion for people to take the leap. Yes. You know, what does that mean for you? I mean, to take the leap. It, it made me think of, um, you know, I have been an associate pastor for, for a long period of time. One thing I was as a pastor was a principal of an academy. Mm -hmm. And we would take our middle school every year to these climbing things, you know, and they had one area that you had to let go of something and leap for another. And they called it the leap of faith. And literally mm -hmm. you'd have to, you'd be on this thing and then you would leap towards it. And I remember when my daughter was doing it and how I felt as a mama. And so when you and I met and we were talking about take the leap, you know, I was literally thinking of those physical times that you yes. take the leap. But what does that mean for you? Because uh, I think it's core to you. Yes, it, it absolutely is because when I think of taking the leap, I don't just think of one. And I think that's the common, the common way we think about it is we think about the fishermen, right? And how God called the disciples and all of those things. Okay, walk away from everything. And that can be scary, but there are times where that is the leap God has called us to make, like completely from your career, going into your calling, walk away from everything. But I also believe that sometimes we become stagnant. We don't move because we feel like that's the only option. And so to me, it is understanding that there are more than one ways that we can take a leap. There, there are times where God will say, okay, I want you to stay on your full-time job, but I want you to start a business or start a ministry. That is still a leap, you know, because it is something that is not core to what you've been doing. There are other times where, you know, he may be saying, it's time for you to move. It's time for you to completely move and see what I have for you. That is a leap as well. So there are so many other ones. There's times where he's like, I'm not even going to give you all the details, but you'll always have the provision that you need for the leap I'm calling you to make. That's a leap. So all throughout the Bible, we see multiple ways that God will call his children to take leaps. And I, what I like to say is that it's a leaping lifestyle. 
when we're ah, younger, good. yes, <laughs> when we're younger, it becomes so natural to us because I go from first grade to second grade, third grade to fourth grade. I don't think about it. Right. I'm just, this is a part of what happens. I go to the next stage of my life without overthinking it. But when we become adults, sometimes we just get stuck. We get stuck in our way of thinking. We get taught that you go to college, you get one career, you stay in that career for forever. That is how this is supposed to work. So we almost are taught to stop believing that leaps are a part of life. But the truth is that they are. And especially as a follower of Christ, we go from glory to glory, faith to faith, right? So we are constantly moving up the way that God has called us and taking these bold leaps of faith that may not feel comfortable. And most times they don't, they're, they're scary, they're uncertain. We don't know what we're doing. And so the core of the message that I have is taking these leaps because let me go back a little. I started a ministry called I Can't Come Down, and it was helping people walk in their purpose and assignment with focus. And I loved it. I loved pouring into people. I loved encouraging people. I loved all of those things. But I noticed that I'm saying, hey, you got to get focused. You got to walk in your assignment. And people weren't moving. And so I prayed and I'm like, Lord, what is it? <laughs> because <laughs> we have become a very complacent Christian culture, you know, and oftentimes we're like, okay, this is it. This is what I'm doing. I know God is calling me to do more, but I'm not going to. And that's really where this whole taking the leap concept came, concept came from was the idea that there is this missing element and it's that encouragement. It's that truth behind you actually have to take the leap. Like you have to move in order to walk in your purpose and assignment with focus. Yeah. And sometimes if we don't, he'll literally push us out of the nest, you know, yes. <laughs> <He'll> initiate <laughs> it. Sometimes it's more painful, but yes. I, I, you know, something that's behind what you're talking about is hearing the voice of God. Yes. So I can tell that's an important part of your life. How do you hear the Lord on what leap to take? Do oh, I love you that have question. a process. Well, you know, I spend time just in the word of God. And so when I'm spending time with God, this is the way that I do it. I, the first thing I do is I'll sit. I start with journaling. I'll sit and I listen. I learned that we can do so much talking and not enough listening. So I have learned to just sit and listen. What is God saying? What does his voice sound like for me? You know, I always tell people that when I get these ideas from God, I know it's God because I'm just not that smart. Like I'm, I'm, I'm smart, but I'm just not that smart. Okay? So I'm like, that had to be God because that was not Rachel. And um, so I love when I have those moments where I'm like, this was God. And then I line it up with his word. I'm like, this is what his word says. So for me, hearing God's voice is sitting, being still, listening, and trusting that what I'm hearing is not just Rachel talking to herself. What I'm hearing is God's voice and I'm writing it on paper because it's sacred and it's important. And when he is speaking to me, I want to be listening. And so I'll spend time asking questions. I'll spend time just listening. I'll ask him, what is on your heart today, God? And listening to what, you know, he wants me to lean into and to pray about, I ask him for strategy. And then I go into action. Obedience is not always easy, but it's always important. And there are times when we'll hear God say something and we're like, okay, I'm just wait. I'm just wait. And I had to learn that immediate obedience is key. The longer I linger in that thing that God told me to do, but I don't do it, the harder it becomes for me to do because now my flesh has gotten more control than it should have gotten. So immediate obedience is key. So when God is telling me to do something, I try to do it right away. I try to do it right away. I'm not, I'm not perfect by far, you know, but I'm like, okay, this is what God said, you know, and I'll go to my husband and he's always like, okay, that's what God said. That's what we're going to do. So. Wow. I, I love that, that you've got that with your husband. And, you know, I, I think of, um, how kindred our hearts are, you know, my husband and I had, uh, been in pastoral leadership for 28 years in Nashville, Tennessee. You know, we raised our children there. We had moved there, planted our first church there, pastored that for nine years. You know, it was like we loved Nashville. I mean, it was a city we felt called to, destiny. And we went through the season, we could tell that God was shifting us. 
And you don't always know immediately what he's saying. You know, there's a process. So there was actually, you know, two job opportunities outside. One was in uh, Virginia at a Bible college where I was offered a position, traveled out there twice and wanted to say yes in my mind and heard the Lord say no. You know, and then you're like, what are you doing? Got called to interview at another church. It was like a 3,000 member church. And they were initiating me doing the interviewing. So we traveled to North Carolina. And then we sensed, no, that's not it either. Mm. And then we were like, God, what are you doing? We sense you're shifting us. And then I woke up and had a vision of Texas surrounded in flames. And it was the the most vibrant, vital encounter I have had with the Lord to date. And it was completely out of my radar. I didn't know people in Texas. I didn't always want to move to Texas. I mean, Tennessee is really beautiful. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a dream or a desire or anything like that. It was literally, I felt like God was outlining new territory for us, that it was imperative that we go there. Um, and, you know, there was an opportunity to come plant a church, but, you know, planting a church at our age, that's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But we obeyed the Lord, left adult children, moved to Texas, and there's so many reasons I see that he did that in our lives. Mm -hmm. But I know very few people that hit older ages that are willing to take that type of leap because it's also painful. You know, it's ripping, it's risky, you know, all of those things. And you don't always know everything that God's saying. He's just put one light in front of you. And then you look back and what are like, God, that was totally you. I can see it. Um, so have you had situations in your life that have been like that drastic of a leap? Yes. And let me tell you, um, I have a similar story of being called into this job or not even being called, but having, um, this desire to work somewhere, but I did the, I did something different. I actually went, even though I told God, I heard God tell me no. And that <laughs> became, <laughs> that's I, part I of like, the story you know, too. That's, that's part of the story. Right. And that job is what taught me the power of obedience because during that time there where I thought, okay, my income, you know, it's going to be great for the household. It actually was probably the most difficult time for our household financially. Really? And I believe, Yes, because you disobeyed if, God. Because I disobeyed God. Because <laughs> I disobeyed God. And you know, people would say, no, that has nothing to do with it. But I knew. I knew. Because what the, the thing about desires is that sometimes they can be deceptive. You know, I may have this desire and I want to be led by my desires. And we can't be, you know, yes, God will give us the desires of our heart when they line up with his will. That's why I want to make sure that I'm that my will is line is is the same as God's will for my life. And <clears throat> excuse me, he doesn't always reveal what that is. I mean, I have to be okay with that. But desires sometimes can be not even sometimes, many times can be deceptive because there are things that people desire that's not good for them. So we have to watch those. And that's what I had to learn. I desire, I wanted to be a teacher so bad. And so this full-time teaching opportunity came for me. And I knew, I felt it. I know the Holy Spirit. I know what he feels like. And I know he's telling me no. And I was like, mm, but I'm going to go anyway. <laughs> and I kid you not, it was, it was probably, it was the worst decision I made. And when I went to take that resignation letter, two years, I waited two years, two years of disobedience. And I turned in that resignation letter and I just felt a peace. Like, thank you. Can we move on now? Can we go into my will for your life, please? <laughs> <laughs> but God is just so gracious. And um, this is why, you know, taking the leap is so important to me because I've been on both sides of it. I've been that full obedience. I've been that hesitant. I've dealt with the hesitancy. I've dealt with the just flat out disobedient. I know that this is not what God told me to do, but maybe I can make it sound like it is what God told me to do. Like maybe <laughs> if I just 
say the words he said a little differently, <laughs> you know, but God is just so faithful and, and he continues to let me know, like, Rachel, you hear my voice. And that's the key is that was a moment where I learned and I had to accept, I know the voice of God and I can't even pretend and fake myself out into believing that I don't know his voice because I've heard it for so long that I know his voice and I have to learn to trust it, knowing it and trusting it are two different things. Oh, that is so powerful. I, I agree. I just wholeheartedly agree. And learning to know how to hear the voice of God is an epic hero's journey. Because the reality, if you're listening to this Healing Rain audience, I mean, the reality is you are on an epic journey where you're heroic in the fact that you're following Jesus. And then sometimes you're blindfolded, but Jesus is still he's still leading you. And that you've got to be able to listen to him. And what will happen is it will look like you're just brilliant, but you simply learn to listen and obey the voice of the master. Yes. Well, Rachel, as we close, what are just just some closing thoughts you have for listeners? Yeah, you know, as we're talking about healing, the one thing that comes to mind is the healing journey is not easy. You know, we say it and the word healing, it, 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 it sounds like it's going to be this simple thing to do. And it's not. It is hard. It is work. It is knowing and believing that on the other side of that healing, God has something so much greater. And I always tell people, you cannot release what you don't first carry. So if I am called to carry courage, then I have to heal through what made me afraid so that I can release courage to those that need it, right? And so just knowing that the journey is not going to be easy, but it's going to be beautiful. And you're going to look back and say, had I not walk through the healing journey, I don't know where my life would be. Had I not walked through the healing journey, I don't know who I would not be able to impact at this, at this point. So I'm just, I'm so thankful that I did. And I just want to encourage you to do it, do it uncertain, do it afraid, do it, you know, knowing that you are not walking alone, that God is walking with you as you are healing through the things that will be a blessing to so many other people. Oh, that's so powerful. Would you go ahead and just uh, speak over, pray for those that feel like God's calling them to take a leap, that all they're sensing now is the loss and the risk and the vulnerability? You know, they haven't seen the faith. They've got to let go of one thing, you know, in order yeah. to take hold of the next. Would you just minister to people that are in that spot? Yes. Oh, dear God, I thank you. I thank you so much for your word of truth, Lord. When the enemy is speaking lies, when the enemy is bringing fear and discouragement and uncertainty, Lord God, your word is continuing to resound very loud, that you will take care of us, that you will take care of your children, God, that there is nowhere that we go that you are not with us, Lord God. So I just want to encourage whoever may be listening, that you are calling to take a bold leap of faith and remind them that you are with them. They are not alone, that you have placed within them the power of the living, risen Savior, God, and you are with them, God. So I just want to remind them of that truth. And Lord God, I just release a blessing over them that the doors will begin to open for them, that they will begin to experience and meet people that will be a blessing to the journey, Lord, that you will provide provision for them, Lord God, that they will begin to hear your voice. You will give them dreams and visions, Lord, that lets them know that they are on the path that you have destined and orchestrated for them. And I thank you, God, for all that you are going to do in and through them for the souls that they are going to reach, for the impact that they are going to have in the area and the space and the new territory that you are giving them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Rachel Joy, it's, uh, I mean, Rachel, it's a joy. Um, my daughter's name's Rachel Joy. Oh, so. oh I love that. But you, you are a gift to the body of Christ. You are an innovator, a motivator, and a champion of people who need to because God's calling them to take risks. So thank you for that. 
Thank, Thank you. you. And Healing Rain listener, there may be something that you're called to do, but you're feeling stuck. And I, I just want you to know, um, and this is only for a select group of people, I am going to f- have a short window of time of a women in leadership coaching group that I'm beginning. It's a limited amount of space, and it's particularly for women that are already in leadership. You're already, um, uh, you already own a company, and you're in leadership of a country company or maybe you're an executive pastor in ministry or you're already a leader and yet you know that you're stuck but you're just not quite sure how to get unstuck and I just want you to know that's coming up you can check out um, my website for the women in leadership and if that's you and if that would help you to take the leap, then I want you to check that out. Thank you. Thank you for being here on Healing Rain.